Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Dixon, and welcome to this talk titled uh, Regional Scale Fire Severity Mapping in the Northern Jarrah Forests with Google Earth Engine. So I'm Dan, and I want to say thanks to my supervisors, Nick, John, Sam, and Natasha. I think John is over there in the corner. Um, I'm a student, a PhD student in geography at UWA. I'm interested in using GIS and remote sensing to ask ecological questions. Uh, in this case, part of my PhD mapping uh, wildfires and prescribed burns over the last 16 years in, in the northern Jarrah Forest. Essentially taking post-fire aerial photos, using those, using those images to train a machine learning model to then predict uh, the severity of fire. This is the impact of fire on forest canopy at a 30 by 30 meter resolution using uh, Landsat mainly Landsat, and I'm going to dig into that. In this talk, first I'll go over the motivation, why I'm the one doing this work, get into the guts of how the fire severity mapping uh, works, and then talk about some of the benefits of using Google Earth Engine, because I don't think I would have been able to do this uh, project, at least within the amount of time I've been able to do it, without some of the resources from, from Google Earth Engine. So this is a global scale uh, image processing and GIS environment to ask really uh, questions without scale. So what we've got is this Northern Jarrah Forest Fire Severity Mapper. We don't have a great acronym yet for this model. You know, if you've if you've got one, let me know. We're working on it. Um, but really, for each fire, wildfire, and prescribed burn in the last 16 years, those are DBCA fire polygons in the in the DBCA 060 data set. Uh, so, yeah, thanks to DBCA for putting those data together. Those were open source. So I've taken those data and then created a fire severity map with Landsat for each of those fires. So quickly, taking a few steps back, why am I the one doing this? So last year I did a presentation on mapping flowering trees with uh, CubeSat imagery. And so uh, we use PlanetScope, which is a constellation of s miniature satellites, and we essentially take uh, an image every day or every few days and um, create some vegetation indices and, and based on some observations that we took with drones on the ground we build a, a, mo a model to then predict uh, flowering abundance and we did this because uh, flowering is not just a bioindicator of uh, forest reproduction but it also provides nectar and pollen for a range of pollinators birds um, and, and biodiversity in general. So uh, we're interested in, in forest phenology, the timing and, uh, of these plant life cycle events in the Southwest. And we use Earth Engine for that. Uh, really, it's a one-stop shop for uh, loading up our data, processing it uh, through, a, a, you know, building this time series and then making the, the prediction of flowering. And just to give you a quick idea what that looks like, uh, so this is on the, the visualization on the bottom right is the, uh, the, the number of predicted flowering pixels over time from January 1st to March 10th. So this is just a two month window. And then you see that in the, in the map on the right hand side, there's this like um, pulse of flowering that happens over about two to three weeks. Um, and we can make these graphs because we have a, a prediction on each day in the time series. And so we, we're scaling up these data across, you know, the northern Jarrah Forest, looking at Mary, which is, uh, or Carimbia califel. This is one of the, the main eucalypt uh, keystone species in the southwest. And so with those data, we've been making some observations. So this is one flowering, you know, uh, event um, in, in 2018. You may not be able to see it, but it's along the, the water edge. Of, this is a, like Mundaring Weir. And our model is predicting these trees were flowering on this day and this year, uh, but really nothing uh, further inland. And then we, you know, just go back in time, just six months, and there was this uh, prescribed burn that went through this patch of bush um, with a, a bit of a range of severity. And this is uh, impact to the, the crown, right? And so, um, again, this, the, the data that go in, originally the, the fire data are just burn yes no and some metadata like whether whether or not it was a, um, a wildfire or a prescribed burn um, so we need to be working at this scale at the almost the the crown or the the block scale to say to be able to pick up this difference in variation so we want to then ask some questions about some of the drivers of flowering uh, so we have climate and topography but really this fire question 
time since fire and severity of that last fire. So we can get the time since fire with the DBSA polygons, but we, we, need, we then need to go in and say, how severe was this fire? Because there's going to be uh, quite a range and impact on uh, phenology depending on, on severity. And so we've got this model with a few objectives. Uh, first, build, build the model and estimate uh, fire severity with Landsat data. This is a 30 by 30 meter resolution. Uh, we validate across a range of conditions. I'll show you just we validate across different uh, prescribed burns across different seasons spring, winter, and autumn prescribed burns and wildfires. So it needs to be kind of generalizable across a range of dif di different fire types. And then we apply that model to 717 fires, about 1 million hectares of, of burnt area over the last 16 years. Because we want to then go back and say, we have all this flowering data, all this phenology data, and go back to different areas that were burned at different times at different severities and ask questions about how they impacted phenology. So this is our response variable, what we're trying to predict in the model. Uh, it's just five categories, uh, ranging from unburnt to canopy burnt. Category one is unburnt or mostly unburnt. Uh, categories two through four range from uh, a, just a range of canopy scorch. And then category five is, would be, category four and five would mostly be called high severity. And uh, these categories are the same response variables as those used in a couple models over east in Victoria and New South Wales. And we've done that on purpose to create some harmonized data sets that can be used to ask questions about fire severity broadly across environments, across regions. So that was Luke Collins and Rebecca Gibson in Victoria and, and New South Wales. And uh, they're predicting severity really with the same categorical scale. And so for each DBCA FAR polygon, we take, uh, we take that polygon and we really only need two bits of information using Earth Engine. We need the geometry, the shape, and we need the date of the fire. And then we can delineate the pre and post fire image composites, which would be um, a composites of all of the Landsat images intersecting that fire polygon before or after the fire date. And then we take the, the median composite value of all of those pixel values for each pixel. And uh, we take all images before and after 64 days of the fire. And we do that to avoid some of the, Im some of the impacts of noise from, from clouds, cloud cover, haze that may have been uh, missed in the cloud mask. And then we predict this severity score with five categories. And so in Earth Engine, it's, it's built so we only need those two bits of information, the fire polygon and then the date. And then we can map over all of the fires because all of the fires in the database have the, the geometry and the fire date. So this is um, our study area, the Northern Jarrah Forest, and uh, this is a specific bio uh, Eber region, and looking at open eucalypt forests and woodlands. And then you can see in that map C, pretty much the entire Northern Jarrah Forest has been burnt at least once in the last uh, 16 years, uh, some areas two to three times, and that's from prescribed burns and wildfires. And then map D shows a collection of 64 uh, wild, per wildfires and prescribed burns that I was able to then go, go to Nearmap, which is a private company, and they, they, prov they provide sa um, aerial imagery with three to seven uh, centimeter resolution. I was able to find 64 fires with a post-fire image available. And then I went into those 64 fires and I uh, defined different regions of the fire belonging to the, one of those five categories. And so I did that for about 11,000 pixels. It took uh, a couple of weeks. And uh, those are for, for fires between 2010 and 2020. And then we eventually throw uh, t 34 of those fires, the severity scores, into a random forest. This is a supervised uh, classi classification model. And then we predict uh, those, one of those five categories. And so the uh, predictor variables, these are different uh, spectral indices computed from Landsat data and some of the common ones like the normalized burn ratio and the normalized different vegetation index. I'm not, not going to go into these, uh, but they're reflective or um, they represent changes to uh, quite a few different things from vegetation to changes in soil cover or changes in uh, charred material. And so the random forest is, is good with taking in uh, a number of different predictor variables that may be correlated. In this, in this case, these are probably all correlated. 
um, but they all represent a little bit so, something something new to train the model for what it's looking for in this case severity so I'll get into the uh, model accuracy of those 30 fires that the model has not seen. So these are, this is an independent testing data set that the model has never seen these fires. And this is for wildfires and prescribed burns. The overall accuracy, which is the number of correctly classified pixels divided by the total number of pixels, was about 84%. Uh, and that's for 5,612 Landsat pixels. And our accuracy is a little bit higher for wildfires. Uh, mainly because wildfires are mostly unburnt or very high severity categories. It's really the, the difficult part is predicting those category two and three, which is burnt understory but unburnt canopy. And it's pretty hard to see that sometimes, especially with closed canopy uh, force. I should show these confusion matrices or um, error matrices for A, B, C, and D, which show wildfires, pres prescribed burns in autumn, winter, and spring. And what you see is for each, for each matrix on the x-axis is your observed fire severity, what I called it on the ground or from the aerial photo. And then on the y-axis is the predicted fire severity score. So if we have um, a, a perfect classification, we'd have you know, nice diagonal lines uh, for each box. But you can see that um, you know, rarely are we predicting across more than one category. For example, looking at wildfires, predicting uh, category two and category three, which is low canopy scorch and mid canopy scorch. Like I said, this is not easy to do in wildfires or prescribed burns. Um, and I'd say that's a large source of our error. But we were pretty happy with these, with these results. And we started kind of making pr spatial predictions of fires to, uh, to see what these things look like. And so this is just two examples, one wildfire A and, and uh, an example wildfire B. So wildfire A was you know, majority category four and five, very high severity. Um, this is mostly happening in, in the summertime where it's much hotter. But again, this is just the, we're just measuring the impact to forest canopy. And uh, we're able to detect these kind of low severity patches on the, uh, in this case, on the, the northeast part of that fire and kind of accurately depicting these burnt understory but unburnt canopy. And then the inverse, we, you know, also works for prescribed burn. So prescribed burn, that's, you know, majority category two and one, one to three. This is low severity. Uh, we're also detecting some of these high severity patches, in this case, on the eastern part of that, of that fire. So these would be crown scorch or reaching the crown fires. Just to visualize, getting close. This is actually the wildfire from earlier 2021 the uh, Waterloo bushfire, and we show two of our predictor variables, are, which is our normalized uh, difference vegetation index and, the, and our DNVR scores, which are you know, representing changes in vegetation and changes in charred material. And then we provide our uh, predicted severity score. And then on the, on the bottom left there, we have our, uh, the area of each burnt uh, severity category in, in square kilometers. Just to visualize, drive the point home, we're doing pretty well at picking up these uh, within stand uh, changes in um, uh, severity patterns. And so quickly, some of the benefits of, er of Earth Engine and uh, how you know, the tools over there made a lot of this possible. Uh, so with, in Earth Engine, we can access pretty much every Landsat image that's available to us. Um, surface reflectance ready to go, analysis ready data. And uh, we have about s a little bit over 700 fires. And for each fire, we use about 12 Landsat images. And that's about 8,400 images that I don't have to download and process myself and to compute all those, all those spectral indices. That's all done on Google servers. And I never see, uh, none of the data is actually touching my laptop other than through some you know, JavaScript or Python. So I mean, that's alone like massive because anybody with a you know, basic web, uh, laptop with Google Chrome or whatever browser can run the analysis. And it's built, th this tool set is built so I you can access all, that, all those data, you can process, you can you know, do all your pre-processing, all of your model building, whatever it is, and then train your model and then predict with your model all in the same environment. Um, again, never having any of the data touch, touch the computer and so you, it's, it's a one-stop shop to do your whole analysis. And obviously, they've, they've built it that way on purpose. Um, and then finally, there are many options for visualizing your data. 
Uh, and so you can visualize the data in the code editor, which is very nice. You can use like Jupyter Notebooks, some other open source um, mapping libraries in Python and bring those into a notebook and you know, visualize your fires or make, make plots of your data, whatever it is. And then there's uh, also opportunities to make um, apps for users to visualize your data without actually having to mess with the data at all. So this is just one example of the paper of this uh, of the outputs of this model and so from here we want to make this paper is currently being reviewed but once it's if it's published hopefully we'll make the the app fully available and also all the rasters that we've created to be easily accessible and, and downloadable so then if, if anyone is trying to ask questions about you know like cockatoo habitat or you know uh, honeybee habitat whatever it is they can then They'll have access to the polygons from DBCA data, but then they can also access the severity, predicted severity scores. So I think that's a nice kind of segue from the earlier presentation, where it's like we're taking data that was made open source, and then we're kind of processing it. We're, we're like sending it through the, this washing machine or some sort of processor, and then we're spitting out some other stuff on the end uh, to give users more data you know, available. That is the end of the presentation. So go check out the flowering paper, paper if you're interested, and hopefully this fire paper soon, and then hopefully sometime next year, a paper linking the two, looking at these relationships between fire and forest phenology. And quick thanks to my supervisors in the CRC for Honeybee products, which funded the research. Thank you.